those of you who don't know Paul, Paul is our Northeast Florida expert on meteors and meteor showers. If you want to know about meteor showers, Paul's the guy you go to. He's president of the Ancient City Astronomy Club and also a member of us. So, Paul? Thank you, Mike. Hi, Paul. Hello, everybody. Hi. Everybody I know and greetings to everybody I don't know. Yes, on your own. I apologize in advance. I have very bad hearing. I don't want to dissuade anybody from asking questions. Believe me, there's no such thing as a dumb question. I may be able to give you a dumb answer, but... <laughs> so if you got one, raise, shout it out. I'll come to you so I can hear it. Questions are encouraged. Okay, Mike, go ahead. Some of what we'll cover, what exactly are meteors, a little bit about what they are not. There seems to be a lot of misinformation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, how best can we see them? Which way to look? I'll, I'll tell you right now. The very best way to look is to be out observing with Dennis. Okay? Whatever way Dennis is looking, you look the other way. <laughs> okay, that's the program. See you all later. <laughs> now, there's a little more to it than that. We'll talk a little bit about that. What time of the night or of the year is best, and what are the best? Where are the best places to see them? First of all, what they are—they're often called, of course, shooting or falling stars—and we know that they have absolutely nothing to do with stars at all. They are tiny particles of rock and metal debris entering the atmosphere from outer space. They're ETs. They're extraterrestrials. Vast majority of them are caused by comets. There are a small number, but a very important small number, caused by asteroids. We'll talk a little bit about that. And, of course, they blaze into a flash of light through the night sky in a process called ram pressure. I was always saying it was collision with the Earth's atmosphere, but collision is uh, scraping together of two solid <coughs> particles kind of thing. Ram pressure is when a solid particle comes into a gaseous environment like the Earth's atmosphere. So there's an ionization type of thing that goes on that causes that bright flash that we see light up <coughs> the night, hopefully, if they're that good. Um, most people are amazed to find out that most of those bright, fast streaks you see in the night sky are caused by a particle no bigger than a speck of dust or a grain of sand. We'll talk about how and why such a tiny little particle can cause such disruption in our Earth's atmosphere for a split second. Okay, Mike, this is a classic image of a meteor. I wish I could say I took this picture. I didn't. But that's what they look like, streaking across the sky. Um, average length of time they're visible is a half a second. <laughs> if you see one, one, two, three seconds, that's pretty darn good. And occasionally, like the one that, Veronica's not here tonight. Veronica and I were at Matanzas Inlet and we saw one. We could almost have a sandwich by it. It was several seconds going by. <laughs> Simply amazing, something like that. Okay, Mike. Confusing comets and meteors. A lot of the general public <clears throat> seem to think that comets are meteors that a comet is one of these things that's going to flash by in a half a second and be gone. That's not quite the case. Uh, your comets, which comets and meteors are locked together like this in their togetherness, but they're totally different in the way they appear in our sky and the way they act in orbits around the sun. So your comets are going to be the ones that will be visible for days, weeks, even months at a time, whereas the meteors that are caused by that comet will flash by in a split second. We'll talk more about that. Where do we get them? Uh, where do we get the word meteors? It, I'm going to sound like big fat Greek wedding here. It's all back to Greek, okay? <laughs> Only two kinds of Greek uh, people in the world. Greeks and the ones who wish they were Greek. <laughs> That's according to the movie. But in this case, the word me it comes from meteoros, and if you're Greek, I apologize. I probably butchered that name, that word terribly, uh, which means basically high up in the air. 
And uh, it's a root word, of course, for our well-known term lately, <laughs> meteorology. Because for most of human history, people thought <coughs> that meteors originated within the Earth's atmosphere. Something akin to like lightning discharge or some kind of tricky light pattern throughout the atmosphere. It took until the 19th century before we realized that they were actually coming into the atmosphere from outer space. So that was a uh, epiphany quite a bit. Um, as we see the meteors when they're traveling through the atmosphere, they are going rapidly by. Uh, they will range in speeds from a low of about seven to eight miles per second, which is that one that Veronica and I saw in Kansas Inlet a week or two ago. It was appeared very slow. Others will be up to 44 miles per second. They're the ones that are a half a second, maybe a tenth of a second at best. And of course, some meteor particles, I say that there's Veronica, hey. Um, most of the meteor particles are about the size of a speck of dust or a grain of sand, but not all of them. They can be bigger. The ones, we'll talk about the bright ones in a minute, they can be up to maybe walnut sized. Some in extreme cases, the one that security cameras get all over the place can be up to the size of a car. Some even bigger than that that cause impacts. But 99.9% .9 are tiny and we don't have to worry about them coming down. This is a classic image of what we call a fireball. A very bright, yes, Rick? How in their determination did they determine that it was the size of the spectrum dust or the sand? About the size of it? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of ways uh, through spectroscopy and so forth. Uh, they can get it. A correlation between the brightness and the potential size. There's a lot of different ways that they can do it. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. The fireball in this case, this by the way was taken during the 1966 Leonid storm, which we'll talk a lot about in a minute. Um, the bright one, of course, is the fireball, and many times the fireball, because it's a larger particle and sometimes weirdly shaped, will burst at the end in a term, what we call a terminal burst. That is the technical term for that type of fireball is bolide, B-O-L-I-D-E. Bolide is a fireball that ends in a terminal burst. And almost all large fireballs do end up in a terminal burst. In the movies they show the meteors flying through and crashing right into the earth like a bullet. No, they come into the atmosphere to a certain level then they break up and burst, and the particles come floating down like falling leaves. Okay, Mike? These I call the three M terms for meteors. Meteoroid, meteor, and meteorite. And I'll tell you what, the, the press and the general public get these things flip-flop like they're like a seal juggling. They're similar, and they always get the wrong term. <laughs> The terms are meteoroid, R-O-I-D at the end, which refers to the particle while it's in interplanetary space beyond the Earth. There's nothing to do with the Earth at that point. That's a meteoroid. The meteor is the particle while it's in the Earth's atmosphere. And this is the other thing that blow people away. Most of the meteors that we see at night actually begin to burn up about 90 miles up in the atmosphere. I got a neat picture later of the ISS, which is higher than 90 miles, taking a picture of a meteor falling into the atmosphere below them. Uh, and they are usually totally burned up at about 40 miles, so 90 to 40, 50 miles. And that half a second that you see them, they've gone 50 miles. It's crazy. And again, less than one second, sometimes only a half a second. The particle that passes through the atmosphere impacting the rock. Okay, the meteorite is the one that comes all the way through the atmosphere, ends up on the ground, or in somebody's house, or in the ocean. Most of them go in the ocean. Okay. How often do they happen? 24-7, 365. Morning, noon, and night. They're constant, all the time. But of course, most of the ones that we see are going to be at night because it's dark. 
But occasionally, there'll be one so big and so bright that it will be visible in the daylight. That's called a daylight fireball. And there was one a few years ago in Florida, right here. Folks in Jacksonville, if you were out at 10 o'clock on that Sunday morning in 2016, you'd have seen a daylight fireball go by. In fact, several folks triangulated the path, went out into the Ocala National Forest and found meteorites from right here in Florida. Rare, but it does happen. Uh, most of them are very faint. The fainter they are, the more of them there are. So here goes the problem with light pollution. They're very hard to observe from the city. <clears throat> you got to go out into the dark skies to do, do your best at seeing meteors. But if you're lucky enough to catch a bright one, and believe me, they can happen anytime. You can see it walking the dog at night or do your windshield driving back from Publix. I've seen several like that. The overall average occurrence is about seven meteors per hour. Believe me, that varies quite a bit from one or two in the early evening up to 15 to 20 just before dawn. And it can be hundreds or thousands per hour during a meteor shower. But the overall average is about seven per hour if you go out. So expect on a non-meteor shower night, dark sky at the swamp or the fairgrounds, about roughly midnight, you might see about seven per hour. Eight o'clock at night, two, three. Well, well I, I got a graph. We'll show you how and why that happens. Uh, and of course, the number visible that you see increases steadily through the night. The later you go, the more you see. Okay, more after midnight. Why? All right, let's go pretend we're out in a spaceship. We go straight out from the North Pole of the Earth, several thousand miles. We turn around and we look back. What we're seeing is the pole in the middle of that circle, the circle of the Earth, rotating counterclockwise in our rotation and also going forward in our revolution around the sun. We forget. Everything seems like it's all peace and quiet here. We're motionless, right? No, there are several very significant speeds involved that we're not aware of. Revolution, rotation of the Earth. So these things cause the number of meteors. Um, okay, we're going to go, uh, let's start at noon, which would be directly in the middle of the day side, right? Half of the world at night, half of the world in the daytime. Noon. We go through the afternoon and we come to, on the left, would be sunset, approximately. Or getting darkness. Twilight takes 90 minutes, so it's not an immediate light to dark, it's a transition period. But when it gets fully dark, called end of astronomical twilight, we're in the night side, but we're also on the back, we're, we're traveling left to right. So we're looking out the back window of the Earth. If you Go in a car after a rainstorm, the rain is pounded your windshield. You better have good windshield wipers. But look out the back window. It's almost nothing hitting the back window. Same thing on Earth as far as the meteors go. Midnight would be directly in the middle of the night side. We cross over. Then we're facing the direction that the Earth is revolving through the, uh, through the solar system. Then we're catching this stuff head on. It's coming into the windshield. And the number is significantly different and more. But it makes it harder because who's up at 3, 4, or 5 in the morning? You know? <laughs> Which makes meteor watching a very challenging thing to do, but also very rewarding. And I got a little bit of a, uh, a good news later in the show that. You don't have to be up at 4 o'clock in the morning all the time. Okay, I'm going to meteor crop. Very best time of the year to look for meteors, absolutely. Uh, they happen at the same time, year in and year out. All, except one, meteor showers are caused by comets. One, which I'll talk about, the Geminids, is caused by a weird hybrid between an asteroid and a comet that's just recently, within the last few years, been identified. Still not very well understood. And that is the Geminids coming up in December. 
Um, and the ones that are caused by comets are basically debris from the tail. Comet comes to the, uh, is in orbit, much different type of orbit than the planets. The planets are on like a plane, like if you put them all out on this line and they all go in a circle, the comets can come in from every angle, above, below, back behind, 45 degrees, 60 degree angles. So when we intersect those, those orbits by the comet, we encounter the particles from that comet's tail. And this is what gives us the meteor showers. Because the Earth is so regular in our rotation, we can almost set our watch by when it's going to happen year after year after year, which makes it nice. Then there are some unexpected ones, too. Uh, the meteor showers are named after the constellation where the radiant lies. What's a radiant? We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, may, may meteor showers can produce up to 120 to 140 meteors per hour, and in many cases, significantly more than that. Right? This is a quick, uh, what I call the meteor shower top 10. <laughs> David Letterman had his list, I have mine. <laughs> this is the, uh, the 10 meteor showers every single year that produce the best. The uh, dates that they occur, all meteor showers have a range of dates where they begin, reach a maximum, taper off, and are finally gone. But that point at the top, the apex, is the maximum. And that's the dates, the one on the column there, that are the best time to see meteors throughout the year. Um, you can see right now, we got one, two, three, four, five of them listed that we haven't even happened, that hasn't happened yet. We've still got them out ahead of us. So this is why I like to have the meteor talks during those times or before those times when we're gonna actually have some good chances of seeing some good meteor activity. Uh, the two in red, Perseids, around the 12th, 13th of August, and the Geminids coming up on the 13th of December are the two very best of the year. By far, absolutely, hands down, amazing. And the Geminids will be this year if we can get it clear in December. December is the worst month of the year in Florida for weather. Oh, don't <laughs> say that, Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> Usually. Okay, Mike, let's go. Uh, this is just a quick graphic showing the uh, orbital dynamics involved. The sun in the middle, Earth doing its yearly revolution around the sun. Comet's particle, the, uh, the comet orbit is coming in. And when at August 13th, the Earth and the comet's orbit are in the same spot. We pass through those particles and we get the Perseid meteor shower. And that, of course, that, does, that only shows one. There are actually hundreds of looping orbital meteor streams that the Earth is encountering. There's a meteor shower every night of the year. But only those top ten that I just showed are the ones that are really exciting to look at. Explanation of a radiant effect. I love this slide. We get out of a British book on meteors. Um, Dennis, that's you right there, okay? The little <laughs> in the back there, that, that, that's you. And you're seeing what looks like, okay, the meteors are actually coming in in perfect parallel lines, okay? But because of this trick of perspective which causes parallel lines to diverge to a point in the distance, have you ever, been out on railroad track, got down close and looked at the rails on that railroad track, they will disappear into the, to a point in the distance. Meteors do the same thing. And the, that's what Dennis is going to see on the right, even though they're coming in like that on the left, he's going to see coming in like that because of that trick of perspective where parallel lines appear to radiate out from a certain point. Got a couple of cool pictures to show that effect also. Okay? This, I use the Perseids as an example. All meteor showers have this effect. 
Uh, you see the, the Perseus come from the constellation Perseus. The meteor shower is named for the constellation that the particles appear to come from. Pretty simple stuff. Perseus produces the Perseids, Gemini, the Geminids, Leo, the Leonids, so on and so forth. And this is, a, if you're out on uh, August 12th at about 11 p.m. at night and you're facing towards the northeast, you'll see per Perseus rising in the northeast and the meteors will appear to be coming from that point. And as the radiant rises in the sky and comes up to the high point, they're hitting all over the sky. So the, very, the number you see is greatly increased. The Earth is blocking a bunch of them here. But as it twists around, it's not blocking it anymore. Okay, Mike. Meteor watching the basics. One of the reasons I love meteor watching is it's cheap. <laughs> Which may mean I am too, but no equipment's necessary. Other than the gas it takes you to go out to places dark, it's a very inexpensive way to get interested in astronomy. Um, binoculars can be used to enhance the viewing during the times when there aren't a whole lot of meteors going on. Get those binoculars going. We have, uh, I'll show you a picture. We recommend that you use a reclining chair. It's called a zero gravity chair. You can get them at Target, Ace Hardware, Walmart sometimes. They recline nicely and they flop back and they're so comfortable and then staying awake becomes your biggest job. <laughs> Been there, done that. Uh, as we mentioned, dark skies are the best, comfortable reclining chair. If you stand up, you're going to get a stiff neck. Okay? Not comfortable. Folding chairs, you'll get a stiff neck because you still got to crane and look up. But when you recline backwards, you're looking up com com comfortably, and it's great. Um, as I mentioned, the bad part is you've got to get away from city lights, buildings, and trees. The three great enemies of a meteor observer. Lights, trees, buildings. I'll, I'll call that four. Full moon is the other one. <laughs> Full moon we can do nothing about. But trees, buildings, and lights we can outmaneuver. Clouds. Knock them down. Clouds. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, uh, obviously most enjoyable during the top ten meteor showers and try to avoid full moon time. New moon is the best. We, media watchers love new moon. We, we don't like full moon. In between, you've got varying situations where some part of the night is dark and the other part of the night's got the moon up. It, it gets a little funky. But, uh, now this I just saw. Somebody posted it on Facebook. And it, it's... It's important in meteors, but it's very important in all of amateur astronomy, and that's the concept of magnitude, or the brightness of the objects. And it goes into the uh, differences in magnitude. Each step is a difference in brightness of two and a half times. So the, different, the, the, the lower the number, the brighter the object, okay? The brightest star other than the sun, Anybody know, quick, what the brightest star other than the sun? Sirius. 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 Sirius, the dog star. Yep. Are you serious? It is minus 1.6 approximately, which is between minus 2 and minus 1 on the scale. No star in the night sky is brighter than Sirius. <laughs> Interestingly enough, in the winter time, you get Sirius bright and high as number 1. Number 2 is down about 30 degrees below, and that's Canopus. <laughs> So you got number one and number two both in the same sky at the same time. When we do our Astro 101 at the, uh, and then of course it goes down from there, there's about uh, 20 or so that are first magnitude. But every increment you go down, the number of stars in that lower number is incrementally raised. And the naked, the naked eye limit some of that is individual perception, but as a general rule, if you're out of the swamp or the fairgrounds, not quite the fairground, maybe more like the swamp, and you've got pretty good sharp eyes, you can see about 6.5 plus 6.5 magnitude star with your naked eyes, okay? 
from downtown Jacksonville, maybe 3.5. <laughs> it makes a big difference to go for those dark skies. That's why we're craving them so much. But this table is really cool. Um, I'd like to figure out a way to get this out to everybody that you can kind of study it a little bit. It was taken from an old book called All About Telescopes. It goes, I remember that book in the 70s when I first started, so I don't know how long before that it had come out, but some of that, sometimes that old knowledge is great. <laughs> Highly recommend the old knowledge. And that shows you the uh, difference in magnitude. Okay, if you go from, say, like uh, a first magnitude star, uh, Spica in Virgo, Deneb in Cygnus, a um, couple of stars in Orion. Those are called first magnitude, okay? Now the ones that you can barely, barely see if you're out at the swamp are about six magnitude. The difference between one and six is five. Look on the chart there, the difference of five magnitude is a difference in brightness of 100 times. Because you go in 2.5, times 2.5, times 2.5, times five times. It's a logarithmic scale, not an arithmetic scale. That's enough for math. <laughs> but it's interesting and, and cool to know this stuff. And meteor observing can help you begin to see these differences in the magnitudes that will make you a much sharper observer. Yes, Veronica? So the same scale for star magnitude is used for meteor. The same which scale? Now? The same scale is used for star magnitude as meteors? I mean, it's the same? Yes, yes. The question was, do meteors do the same thing that stars do? Yes and no, in a way. Good question. Your star is going to be sitting there all the time. You know, it'll be up for hours, and you can look at it and judge the magnitude. But a meteor flashes by in a half second. So you've got to kind of train your eyes to recognize the apparent level of brightness in that meteor shipping, slipping by at one half second and judge it against the stars you know are first, second, third, fourth. It takes some practice. It takes some practice. But it makes you one heck of a sharp observer when you get it down. Okay, Mike. <coughs> All righty, the big thing right now is the upcoming major meteor showers. This is four of the big five. I didn't throw the tards in here. Talk, uh, ask me about the TARDs. We'll keep them on kind of a separate plane right now. The big four are the Orionids, the Leonids, the Geminids, and the Ursids. The Ursids are a little challenging, but they're a pretty cool shower. The next one, the big one, the one I'm primed up for, are the Orionids, which will come up. Uh, the maximum is what we call a plateau maximum. They raise up to their high level, stay at it for four or five nights, and then finally drop off. The Orionids and the Eight Aquarians are both caused by Halley's Comet, which both meteor, the Eight Aquarians in May, Orionids in October, both of them exhibit that characteristic of a broad maximum. Because Halley's Comet is a short period comet, 86 years, 76 years, been around thousands of times, perturbated by the planets a little bit, has extended the width of the comets. Tail. So we get to go through the doggone thing for five, six nights. It's really cool. Leonids are exactly the opposite. November 17th and 18th. Both the Leonids and the Orionids are tricky because they're for morning jobbers. I'm sorry, guys. You will not see any of Leonids or Orionids before midnight. But if you can get out, and if it's on a weekend, if you're working or if you're retired like us, no problem, right? Dark, clear sky. <coughs> Three, four, five in the morning are the best time to see both the Leonids and the Orionids. Now, the Leonids are one of the most famous showers in astronomical history. They're responsible for us learning about the fact that they come from outer space and not within the Earth's atmosphere. Perseids are good for that, too. Um, the, per the Leonids are caused by a comet called Temple Puddle which has about a 33-year period, which means that 33 years that comet is coming around by the sun, and every 33 years it 
brings a chunk of particles with it which cause what we call a meteor storm. Meteor storm instead of a hundred an hour is thousands per hour. The last cycle of that was 1999 to 2002. I was blessed to be able to see them. Did anybody in here catch either the 2001? Excellent, excellent. Several of you. That was mind-blowing. We were at the highest spot in St. John's County. That's right. It was the old landfill. That's right. We watched the leaders from a giant pile of garbage. <laughs> Which is really prophetic because they're garbage for the comet coming out, you know. There's stuff the comet's ejected. Uh, anyway, the next predicted cycle, we're not in it right now, but the nice thing about the Leonids is they do a lot of unexpected stuff. And there is a prediction, however accurate it may be, that there might be an enhancement this year possibly on the morning of November 19th, possibly up to 300 per hour, possibly worth checking out whether it happens or not. What's that? It's a Saturday. That is a Saturday morning. Yes, it is. Saturday morning. And we'll have a little bit of warm-up because the normal maximum of the Leonids is about the 17th of November. So if we start to see a little bit of activity two mornings before, it's going to enhance the chances we may see the big show on the 19th. So mark that down. Could be amazing. But the next regularly predicted cycle will start about 2032, 2033, which is only 10 years away, 10, 11 years away. I plan on being alive for it. I mean, I hope I am. You younger folks will definitely be alive for it. So that is something you'd want to see. The Leonid storm cycle is one of the most incredible things in nature. Right up there with a total solar eclipse or a spectacular comet. Can't, can't say more. The Geminids come up uh, on the night of December 12th and 13th. This year it's a last quarter moon which will rise at midnight. So all, of, all night long from six in the evening until midnight is a dark sky. And the Geminids are very active early in the evening. You can see good activity from the Geminids at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. And then as you go towards midnight, they can be producing that 120 to 140 an hour. Then the moon will come up, cut into a little bit, but still be very impressive. So pray for a clear night, December 12th and 13th and 13th and 14th. Yes, Richard. Unlike last year, this year for the Orionids and the Leonids, we also are not in the full moon cycle this year, right? Had the wish now? Unlike last year, we're not going to be close to the full moon for the Orionids right. and the Leonids. Right, right. It works, generally it works that one year, every one of these meteors, these last four, they hit about 30 days apart. So if the moon's full for one of them, it's going to be full for all of them. It's like catching that green light, you know, down the middle. You know, you get them all or you get none of them, you know. This year, fortunately, last year, as Richard said, we lost them all. They were all at full moon. And there's hardly any sense at watching a meteor shower during a full moon because you're only going to see 10% maybe of those 140 an hour if you're lucky. But this year we got a better situation. The Orionids and the Leonids are both very near new moon, so there's no problem there. And the Geminids are at last quarter, so we still got half a night dark for them. So that's why I'm talking about it now. There's some really cool opportunities for meteor showers coming up. Okay, Mike, I think we got a few cool pictures, a few pretty pictures. None of them I took. Perseids from Slovakia. This is showing that radiant effect that we talked about. This was a time exposure or a stacking where they put a hundred one-minute shots together and, and had a composite of many meteors. But you can see the point near the middle there where they all appear to be radiating out from, and that is the radiant point of the shower. And he was lucky enough, this guy, to catch a really bright one there in the middle. That one would have been classified as fireball. The textbook and uh, 
dividing line for a fireball to a regular meteor is about the magnitude minus four. In other words, if the meteor you see is nearly as bright as Venus is, or brighter, it will be classified a fireball. If it's almost as bright as Venus, more like Jupiter, it's a bright meteor, not quite a fireball. I mean, it's all kind of, you know, relative. But that gives you kind of a ballpark. Yes, Roger? <clears throat> What's the difference between a fireball and a bolide? I'm sorry, Roger? The uh, difference between a fireball and a bolide. What's the difference? Yeah. Actually, there isn't a whole lot of difference, Roger. Okay. The, the strict definition of the bolide will have the fireball, which is brighter than Venus, mm -hmm. ending in a terminal burst and bursting. Oh, okay. A non-bolide fireball will just be a regular burnout without bursting at the mm -hmm. end. But 99 times out of 100, a fireball will burst at the end. Because it's a bigger particle. Good question. Okay, Mike. This is the Orion that's coming up uh, later this month, 21st through the 25th. They appear to radiate from the upraised arm of Orion, well above the, uh, the belt and the sword. Um, about 5 a.m. that morning, they're going to be popping 20 to 40 an hour. It's a very interesting little meteor shower. I love it because it's challenging. They're real fast, they're real faint, they're real short. Get into a good dark sky and you're going to see some really cool meteors. That was from Mongolia. Okay. What date is that again? The date? Is it 5 in the morning? What date? I'm sorry? What date is that? 5 in oh, the morning? Oh, uh, October 21st through the 25th. The, and it's mornings. Oh. If you're out at midnight, you will not see any Orion. The most, best time is between 3 a.m. and dawn, which we call pre-dawn. Now, the Leonids are a little bit better. We can see them starting at midnight. You cannot see the Leonids before midnight because they don't, the radiant hasn't risen. The radiant has to rise above the horizon to, be, to see those meteors. However, if what we're hoping will happen for the Leonids occurs, with the timing they're predicting, we could see an amazing effect called earth grazers. Earth grazers are meteors from a meteor shower, like the Perseids. Or the Le All meteor showers do it, but the Leonids do it like nobody else does it. If the radiant is right on the horizon almost, the meteors will come skipping across the atmosphere like throwing a flat rock across a pond and they will go skipping across the entire sky. That's an earth grazer. They're amazing. The Geminids and the, Pers and the Leonids do it the best, followed by the Perseids. Okay. Oh, oh, go back, Mike. I'm sorry. This is the one I mentioned was taken from the ISS. One of the astronauts during the Perseids got a shot from above of the Perseid entering the atmosphere beneath them, which I think is pretty amazing. Okay. This is a typical ACAC meteor watch. This was the crazy crew out there at, uh, for the Geminids this last December, December 21st. It had been cloudy all night long. All of a sudden at 3 o'clock, the clouds broke. And we had two hours of amazing observing, and then this guy sucked back in again at 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> we were praying. I guess somebody heard it. But we had a big group out there, and we saw many, many fireballs, 120 an hour. It was just crazy and really awesome to be able to share that with folks. So stick with me. Uh, the ACAC, I guarantee you, will always be out for these things if it's clear. You're all welcome to come. We usually go to the fairgrounds because it is, there are no trees. 108, 360 degree horizons in all directions. So anybody's welcome, please come on by. Hey, Paul, where was that taken out? Is that Matanza, right? This picture, where was that ah, taken? this picture was taken at Matanza's Inlet. 
Yes, ma'am. Do you have a calendar of dates you're doing that? I'm sorry, my hearing is terrible. On, on your website, do you have a calendar of scheduled dates for this kind of stuff? Uh, we're working on that. Okay. We've got a kind of a prototype of a calendar, but what I'll do is, uh, if you're on Facebook, you're not on <laughs> Facebook. Let me get your email address. Okay. Because I, I've, communication is a dual thing. I, I email it to the folks who don't do Facebook, and I put it up for the, on Facebook for the folks who do. So please don't leave without me okay. getting your, your email. And the same for anybody that, that wants info. In fact, go to the next slide. Right? Contact info. My cell number's on bathroom walls all over the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to call, text, email, message on Facebook, shout at me. I love to share meteor showers. I'm just as excited about it 49 years later as I was the first year I started to do it. And the Perseids, the 1974 Perseids were the first meteor shower I saw. And then right after that we met Dr. Mike, Richard Sweetser, and Carl Simmons from the old Astro Gator Astronomy Club. And they were just as crazy about meteors as I was. So here I am. They're, they're gone, but I'm hanging in there. Questions anymore? Thank you. Thank you very much.